welcome to today's update on uh, the Kronos Head program. Kronos has for uh, quite a few years, 11 years actually, been uh, working with creating open, royalty-free API standards for connecting Silicon and software together. We have quite a few companies that, we've, uh, that are working together with Kronos as a consortium, but there's been uh, something missing in the industry. We have um, and we're looking at doing that with an educational program. We have, uh, throughout the years, completed a large ecosystem of uh, standards for multimedia using uh, various audio, 3D, 2D, graphics, parallel computing, and so forth. But the one thing that has been missing has been the Kronos Institute of Training and Education. Supplying the industry with engineers trained to work with these standards. And uh, that's what the KITE program is for, is to correct this lack. So the goal of KITE is to directly support educators and educational institutions. We see that teaching the Kronos APIs are an important part of the ecosystem for the industry to make sure that not only are there APIs out there for people to use, but there are engineers out there able to use them. So we want to create a uh, working partnership between the industry and the educational institutions and the educators that actually teach the classes. We want to encourage educational courses that teach Kronos APIs and the technologies that are used uh, through the Kronos APIs. And just like we have performance tests to provide high quality implementations of the APIs, we want to ensure that the classes that are taught and the, uh, and the uh, engineers when they graduate have the quality of education that they need. So right now KITE is under construction. We're getting, this is an evolving process. And think of it as uh, developing a standard. We're not done yet. So we're looking for your candid feedback in the process and to find out exactly what it is that you, as an educator, need to teach classes regarding the Kronos APIs. We're dividing KITE up into two different parts. One is the community, which is a website, and the other one is educator certification. The website is intended for sharing coursework and material and with a minimal amount of moderation, allow you to develop coursework and materials in a rapid manner so that you can teach the next semester of classes on this semester's standards. So that when your students graduate, they are going to be up to speed on the very latest from Kronos. On the education certification process, we want to have you, as an educator, become certified in teaching criminal standards so that uh, just as the companies that are implementing the standards have the benefit of the criminal certification through the performance process, you, as an educator, can draw the wealth and the strength and um, the power of being certified and using the Kronos logos and the name brand. You'll also gain access to Kronos materials and uh, the working groups. The working groups are going to be an integral part of this so that you have the very latest and uh, information and knowledge. When we look at the community website for KITE, it's going to give free access to the material. We're going to have the open courseware, the Kronos reference and presentation materials, and even have streaming presentations. This will allow you as an educator to rapidly be part of uh, developing and taking part of courseware that has the latest technical information in it. It's also, there's also going to be available for you the links to the latest SDKs and tools, samples, and example code. And uh, for any class, developing classware, Practice is, of course, one of the best ways to learn things. So we're going to make sure that you have uh, technology, the access to technology available for you to give to your students to practice on. 
we're going to have the notice board where you have and you can post internships, projects, uh, companies can post competitions for students to participate in. You can share demos, courseworks, and other projects to allow people to get recognized for the uh, research and for the uh, for any projects that they do in school. And there's going to be newsletters, reports, and interviews so that you can have information about what your peers are doing. On top of this, the intent is that you will have books and paid courseware. You will be able to pay, purchase courseware from companies that have decided to develop them specifically for Chronos education programs and also educational books and uh, other information about the, the APIs. We're still in the process of developing the type website and uh, this is one place where we're looking for input from educators. What is it exactly that you need? How can we give this information to you in a presentable manner so that it's easy for you to take part of? So currently, the um, membership in um, Chronos and the participation in Chronos, we have academic members which are allowed to participate in the work groups. We have contributing members which are companies that participate in the work groups and uh, contribute to developing the specification and we have the board of directors known as the uh, promoters. This is the industry portion of developing the specifications. What we're looking to do is expand this with working groups, getting involved in the educator program, and thereby getting certified educators that can administer the Kronos courses and exams and grant Kronos qualifications to students so that students can actually say, I've gone to an OpenGL certified class, so that when they apply for a job, they can put that on their resume. So this is the process for the educator program. The Kronos working groups are going to work together with the education program in order to make sure that the education courseware is aligned with the technologies and the working group direction. So you're going, the Kite program is intended not to be a standalone program, it is actually going to be developed together with the working groups. So as an institute or company joins the education, educator program, You'll execute the program agreement, and there is going to be an annual cost associated with this depending on your level of membership. This allows you to take part of the program. It allows you to participate and become part of the peer review process to get access to the information and to certify educators in courseware. So the benefits to educators and education institutions are that it allows you to promote yourself or your institution through Kite and the Kite website. You have access to confidential materials and uh, if you um, participate at a level that includes the academic membership, you also get access to the working groups where you can actually sit in on the working groups. We have a lot of reference material available already from Kronos. This is going to be made available to you as educators. You can create and review your coursework together with other educators to ensure that you have a level of education for your students that's applicable and to the level where your students are looking for, and the industry, of course. We're going to have an online listing on the Kite directory where if you offer courses, or you're an educator, you're going to be able to have list yourself as a certified educator. And you'll also be able to sell the premium courseware if you develop it. This is a complement to the free material that's going to be available. So the membership levels of Kite are the individual membership, first of all. And this is for individual professors. There's a lot of professors who teach at more than one university or who are unable to get their university involved. 
we want to make sure that for a reasonable price that you can get involved in the kite program, the education programs, get access to the courseware, make sure that you can get the peer review that you need and exams for your students. So as an individual member in the kite program, you'll be able to get certified as a Kronos instructor. And you can list yourself on the, um, on the kite website as an instructor. The academic membership is the same membership that we've had all along. It's for academic institutions and educators who actually want to participate in the working groups. This allows you to take part of the technologies before they're actually released to the general public. And also give input to the working group of what you feel is needed. So if you're doing research in a field where the working group does not have yet the knowledge, you can give that input to the working group and they can incorporate it into the next version of the specification. Finally, we have the Educational Institution Membership. And this is for university and educational institutions, and it gives you full tight access. It gives you access to all the Kronos confidential material. It gives you access to the working groups. It includes the academic membership. It gives you certification of professors, so the professors that are working at your institution gets, can get certified. You can list your courses and your institution on the PIKE website so students can find you and find out where they can get uh, an education in the Kronos APIs. And this is regardless of the number of APIs and the version of the APIs that you wish to teach. So with that, what Kronos would like to know is KITE what you're looking for as an educator? Is there anything that we're missing? or What else can we do to help you out as educators? And with that, please, any questions? Yes? Um, what languages do they come in? Um, uh, the intent is to have multiple languages so that um, of course, English is going to be the most prevalent language as it's the, considered the international language. There is nothing to preclude you from uh, developing courseware in French, Italian, or Chinese for that matter. It really is dependent up to the professors to decide which language they want to develop the courseware in. I mean, does translating it into another language have an impact on the certified aspect of so in translating the uh, courseware and the certification with that, I think that would have to be taken up on an individual basis. So that is something we want to encourage. It, it is something that we want to encourage. We would like to see educational material in as many languages as possible because it is easier for students to learn in uh, their own language. So I, um, I think we would be positive to it. But it, I would still say that it would be on, a, uh, on an individual basis we'd have to consider it. Japan, there's lots of translations in progress. <laughs> yes, for, for instance, the Japanese market, there's a lot of um, uh, translations taking place, both of uh, books and other materials. Any other questions? Yes? In most, in most universities, a Kronos, anything that Kronos is sport is part of the course. We don't teach Kronos courses. We don't teach a course in OpenCL or OPGL or any other standard. They're part of a course. So in terms of what you would think would be required to be certified, how does that fit in? So the question here is, how does the Kronos material fit into a larger course? Or how does it become certified to fit in when uh, a, a, a language that's a standard that's supported by Kronos is just part of what you do in a course on high performance computing or graphics or, or something else? It's just a part of something else. It's, we don't, I can't imagine most universities saying, we're teaching a course in OpenCL or we're teaching yeah. We're teaching a course in computer graphics, or we're teaching a course in, in, in high performance computing, or, or something else. So, what level of knowledge would it require?
require for someone to be certified when it's only part of what you're doing in the course. Okay, so when you're including uh, teaching OpenCL or OpenGL in a course, which covers a broader material, again, I would say that the Kronos material would probably be a, for the certification to be part of that course. And uh, this is something also that you know, we're in the process of developing and we're taking your feedback and we're probably going to be discussing it over dinner tonight. Um, but this is one of those things where I could see a, um, a, a subset of the class or the course you cover a certain amount of material on a specific API in that class, and that portion of the class would be covering the certification, and you would be using that to apply it to the greater class, to the greater coursework. So that you, um, if you do include OpenCL to do uh, parallel computing, you're teaching a class in parallel computing, you're using OpenCL to implement it, or um, to show how it's done, and if you include OpenCL to a certain point, then that class also certifies the student as being OpenCL certified. But it's not the intent of the entire class just to get an OpenCL education, it's to get a uh, parallel computing education. Yeah, the, the, the problem is where, where is that point? Exactly. And, and that is something that I think we'll have to discuss. Neil, do you have any comments? So it's exactly as Eric just said. I mean, it's not we're not intending to create university courses. I mean, that was that's not realistic. The, the certification that we would enable and we find would be an additional bonus um, uh, for people who, who want to take it. So the, the the key work product that we want the, the work groups to help define is an, an item called the exam question, which we can then work. Kind of hand in hand with developers to figure out what is the appropriate level of uh, expertise that we can test for, make it easy for the educators. So, you know, depending on their context, they can offer uh, an exam and an additional um, certificate for people who are interested to be able to represent that they have uh, reached a certain level of competence in, in one of these APIs. But that doesn't replace, obviously, the larger course that will be. There in existing uh, in, in institutions, so this is very much an additive thing on top. <coughs> but, but we do want to have you know, the working groups working together with the educators to figure out what is the um, appropriate level of uh, examination that makes sense, so that these certificates actually have value you know, and a, and a reasonably consistent value across the different institutions. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Dave Schreiner from ARM. So Dave is going to give an overview of OpenGL, and most particularly OpenGL 4. So good morning. My name is Dave Schreiner. Uh, as you mentioned, I work at ARM. Uh, officially, my title is Director of Graphics Technology, but for the most part, I spend my time thinking about OpenGL and related technologies and graphics, things along those lines. What I'm going to give you an update today is just on the OpenGL 4. Right. Um, the most recent version of OpenGL that was uh, released is OpenGL 4.2, and that was released at the North American SIGGRAPH back in June of uh, 2011. So I'll talk about some of the things that are coming through in this talk, and also how OpenGL's influence on all the different technologies that Neil has mentioned uh, affects that. Now, Kronos makes a number of different APIs, uh, makes, but I'm standardized and published uh, specifications for related to the core technology of OpenGL. So OpenGL is kind of the, I, I'm a little biased here, but the flagship graphics API. Sorry, but hey, I am. Um, but clearly, it has a lot of impact with OpenGL EX, right, which is completely prolific in the embedded space. Uh, it also, OpenGL EX has influenced uh, and actually brought about the creation of WebGL, right, for web-based technologies. And because all of them are under the same umbrella, that is the Kronos group, we spend a lot of time communicating back and forth. So as an example, WebGL, because it's in a web browser, it makes it a much more accessible technology. We had to up our game on things like security and how systems operate, because now you can write a web page that could 
seriously impact either the performance or security of your system. So that was never a concern of a graphics API. But because of the environment that it now exists in, WebGL has contributed back into OpenGL uh, new features that are you're seeing in the latest drivers for better security, better performance, uh, and better system stability. Likewise, because of the uh, adoption and uptake of OpenGL ES and the ability to you know, actually develop with this API, lots of folks wait to get uh, system boards and things like that. By that time, you know, your, your time from getting the device to being able to deploy it in the marketplace is considerably shortened. OpenGL ES has now been made available in the OpenGL context on the desktop. That is to say, OpenGL ES now is a bonfire API on a lot of uh, operating systems, Microsoft Windows, for example, uh, that you can take and write core OpenGL ES. Now, up to Windows systems and stuff like that, you can take and port at least your OpenGL ES code directly to your device. So, OpenGL, while it is an API, is an integral cog in the whole Kronos ecosystem when it comes to graphics. And you see how all these different pieces uh, communicate together. Now, likewise, uh, Neil mentioned OpenCL and WebCL, right? That's the computational aspect of it. Graphics is very nice, but with the powers that are available inside of GPUs and devices like that, you want to be able to harness that, but also take the results of those computations and use them for generating rendering. And a lot of the things that occur inside of the Kronos group are making sure that the various APIs, the OpenGL, OpenGLES, can communicate with WebCL, provide that with data, or receive uh, data back from CL to be further processed in the pipeline. The same kind of thing will happen as WebCL becomes standardized in its integration with WebGL. So you can see this complete ecosystem for visual computing. We take care of the, the compute aspects, whether it's on a GPU or CPU, right? heterogeneous computing, both in CL. The graphics rendering side, whether it's from desktop, OpenGL, all the way down to things that go embedded, or even in what I personally think is going to be the new programming paradigm, right? web-based applications through the browser. Uh, it will make your life Having written OSF and TIF applications 20 years ago, I can't wait to get rid of these system dependent pieces. Everyone in the class is kind of like, OSF and TIF? I don't remember that. Yeah, probably good. Um, so, OpenGL has done considerable bits of uh, involvement. In fact, the, the API is coming up on its uh, 21st um, birthday. And that, that's amazing for a piece of software technology. And we've seen a lot of changes that went through it. Uh, released it, uh, the North American SIGGRAPH last year was OpenGL 4.2. And just to give you some perspective, right, that is the fourth major release of OpenGL. The first two releases, OpenGL 1 and OpenGL 2, uh, worked on what we're calling surface realism, right? We were actually trying to get the pixels of your geometric primitives to look the way you want. We had texture mapping, we had lighting and those things. Uh, and, you know, back in uh, 2004, we released OpenGL 2.0. Uh, which included the first bits of programmable shading, or vertex and fragment shading stages, to give you better control over how you actually generated the colors for your pixels. The latest advances in OpenGL, that is OpenGL 3 and OpenGL 4, have more of an about shape realism. That is, GPUs are incredibly powerful and they're really good at processing geometry, but the problem is actually giving your geometry down to the pipe uh, and being able to take advantage of those. So the focuses of the later versions of OpenGL, that is OpenGL 3, for example, introduced what was called geometry shaders. That was the ability for a GPU to actually take and modify geometry within it without involving either the slow system bus or uh, the CPU in the process. OpenGL 4 um, introduced a couple of things. First, it introduced something called tessellation shaders, which are related to hatch-based primitives. So if you go listen to any of the talks by Pixar or whatever, you'll hear them talk quite a lot about subdivision surfaces and patches. This is actually hardware acceleration of those different pieces inside of it. It also enables a, a very snazzy technique called displacement mapping. So this made the API a lot more attractive and a lot more capable in supporting all the kind of rendering capabilities that are required in the industry today. Likewise, the integrated computing in there. Right? GPUs are tremendously powerful devices, and you know, you'd like to be able to harness that power. Both OpenCL will launch you to do that in a particular way, but integrating closely into the graphics API, we've added more computational features that you can exercise inside of your shaders. I'll talk about some of those as I go through some of the features. Now, this is kind of a, this is our logo for the OpenGL 4 release. It's kind of a subway map of all the different features. Uh, I think it's available on the Kronos website. Because it does talk about how the modern pipeline has evolved. You know, introducing vertex shading, geometry shading, tessellation shading, fragment shading, uh, plus all the different data interaction formats. It's actually a nice roadmap to understand the API and see which uh, functions go along with it. 
At the bottom, you see a, a timeline of how things have uh, progressed over time. And in particular, you know, we, we, we have only one other API to compare ourselves to. Uh, the other API uh, had advanced through, and we've taken and adopted pretty much uh, a lot of the same functionality. It's been existing in the hardware. We've just made it available in the OpenGL API. And in addition, the other API doesn't expose everything that OpenGL does. OpenGL has the ability to expose a lot of different pieces. Um, and because vendors have some control over their own destiny, at least in OpenGL extensions, they can expose the latest features that are inside of their hardware. Now, something you'll note very uh, interestingly inside of here, right? Between OpenGL 2 and OpenGL 3, there was a four year time span. Between 2008 and 2011, there's three years. But in that time period, we've released six versions of OpenGL. Actually, seven, because we did 3.3 three and 4.0, but um, that, that, in my personal opinion, wasn't as big of a splash. But the API is very, very alive, uh, adapting to all the modern updates inside of there, and becomes a really viable solution for pretty many any rendering uh, problems. Additionally, it's still the only cross-platform API out there uh, for doing graphics, so hey, that is about. I'm going to quickly go through and discuss some of the new features that are inside of uh, OpenGL 4.2 uh, and dive in a little, uh, the later slides to a couple of things that even more in depth that we think are the headline features. But roughly speaking, um, if you're unfamiliar with the way OpenGL evolves, there's, for any particular version, what's called a core API. And then uh, vendors, as they introduce new features in their hardware or figure out ways to formalize them, we create what are called extensions. And the extensions have a uh, multiple lifetimes, but the important part is if you know, for all these Google lists, the names in red begin with the word R. What this means is someone, a particular vendor, might have a great idea of how to introduce a new, graf uh, new graphics capability. They'll take and present those ideas to the OpenGL Architecture Review Board. That's what the ARB stands for. And the committee itself will consider these things, determine if everyone's hardware can support it, make modifications, and make it a little lower better playing field with an eye towards making the best API for our consumers. That's you guys. And so the way OpenGL evolves is there's a pipeline of we create extensions and then for each new release of OpenGL, we consider what are the best uh, extensions that have come up in that time period, what's been tested, what are people using, and fold that into the core. So at some levels, this provides a vector for designing new hardware as it goes out, but it also is a good vector for reflecting what's available. So all of the, the way this talk is framed, we, I look at the individual extensions that went into being 4.2. So if you said, hey, I have a 4.1 machine, if I upgrade to 4.2, what do I get? What will be this list of stuff? So starting off, one thing we did was add shader atomics. Now this is kind of a more uh, computational aspect, but it allows multiple threads to communicate back and forth between them. Previously, you know, this particularly manifests itself in fragment shading. Right? It's the shader that gets executed per pixel when you're color. If you have multiple ones of those, there are particular techniques that you might want to employ that um, ask for data to be written to a common buffer, and all the threads can do this simultaneously. Well, this provides a synchronization mechanism so that there are, people aren't writing into the same memory addresses at the same time. Uh, if you're familiar with doing parallel programming, atomic counters are a very commonly used technique there. So now they're available inside of your graphics API. Uh, one of the largest and, and most featureful uh, extensions to be added was image load store. This allows you to basically read and write into texture-based objects. So now you can take and, you know, we've been able to write to textures using frame buffer objects, but we couldn't really read to them. And we didn't really have random access to it. Image load store allows you to do this kind of operation. The textures now really become just a chunk of memory, and you can write to various places inside of it. Now, in order to do that without complete chaos, you still need to use atomic counters so that you're not writing to the same addresses. But this now makes OpenGL a much more, uh, specifically GLSL, the OpenGL shading language, a much fuller and much more computationally rich programming language to write your shaders and do your computation. So in image load store, I'll give an example of uh, one very important technique called in-order independent transparency that's enabled by adding this new piece in there. Uh, something to make the OpenGL driver writer's life a little simpler, we have something called texture storage. And if any of you have ever written OpenGL, Actually, any of you have ever written Joe Joe? I at least know my co-author back there uh, has done it. Nobody else? Come on, get out of there, jeez. <laughs> 20 years behind the curve. Um, anyways, there, there's a facility called Texture Mapping, and there's the, the way the API, it was one of the first features ever introduced in Joe Joe. It's been there since 1.0. Um, and the way it's been constructed and, and manufactured over time, there's always been little nuances and errors that creep up that people 
didn't expect. This extension makes it like, okay, this is the way you set these things up, and you're guaranteed not to have an error from that point forward. So if you've done OpenGL programming, you might actually appreciate that part. If you haven't, it was completely like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, transform feedback instance. Transform feedback is a technique to have the geometry processing part of the OpenGL pipeline, that is the transformation of vertices, be written out to a buffer so that you can preserve that buffer and use it for later renderings and save doing a whole bunch of computation. Think of it as a big cache for your geometric objects. Instance rendering of that, instance rendering means take that data and send it to the pipeline multiple times, but change a little bit of characteristics. Maybe it's an object's location or its orientation. Um, transform feedback instance allows you to kind of do that with data that you've run through this transformation feedback process. Once again, if you've never worked with transform feedback, it's probably not terribly exciting. But it's a way to use the GPU in its most efficient forms. GPUs are very good with high memory bandwidth, and lots of computation, so anything we can do to not get the host involved and allow it to recirculate data and take advantage of the massive bandwidth, we get tremendous performance. And this really enables something. Oddly enough, that's not in the other graphics API. Uh, there's a collection of things that come in from the shading library called Shading Pack 420. The 420 represents the OpenGL 4.2 release, and I'll talk some more about some of the features that are in there. Additional features, we've added some more texture compression. So there's a, a industry standard uh, versions of texture compression that are in the other uh, graphics API, and now we can support the same kind of things. The BC6H and BC7 uh, texture formats, those are the very high quality, uh, both in terms of visual quality and compression rates of texture compression. Texture compression is a great technique that's really important for minimizing bandwidth, uh, particularly useful in an OpenGL ES context. OpenGL, being the bigger API, has many, many, many texture compression formats that are available that allow you to tune for quality versus bandwidth and performance. Uh, so this just adds even more capabilities to make this better. Uh, base instance is another way to help with instance drawing. See that. And internal format query is another option where you can basically, modern GPUs don't just fill a pixel. They consider each pixel to be a collection of what are called samples, in the little tiny pixels. Uh, this is a way to find out more information about what's available as far as your samples for a particular pixel. It just helps you do better quality rendering and it makes the API a lot more uh, visible and easy to deal with. So, we also improved uh, or added a bunch of performance enhancements into the 4.2 API. Uh, the first being compressed textual pixel storage. What this allows you to do is um, Basically, I'll update an arbitrary section of a compressed texture. I'll talk more about that later, but this has been an inadequacy of the OpenGL API for a while, that if you're working with a compressed texture, particularly a large one, the only way to update it is to be able to fill the whole thing in. Why is this important? Well, oddly enough, it was asked for by Blizzard, right? the people who made World of Warcraft and those things, where their models sustain damage, and those damages are reflected quite obviously in uh, uh, the, the appearance of them, right? You might get a, a cut in your armor, or start to bleed or something along those lines. And they need to update the, the original textures that go along with it. Well, this gives them a technique to do that, but still be able to do it in a compressed format to be able to maintain the performance of the machine. So that's a, a very important uh, new feature. Uh, I'll get to the language packing in just a second, but this allows even better computational parts. Now, you know, GPUs really have always been floating point machines. They work well with FP32, but now we have better routines for uh, working with integer type data and being able to pack you know, uh, data inside of a shader for later computation down the pipe. Um, if you're a shader aficionado inside of OpenGL, we've added a bunch of things to make life a lot easier. You can encode more information inside of your shaders now. For example, there's something called the layout uh, program. That gives the, the comp shader compiler information about how it should lay out variables and initialize them and so on and so forth. Uh, as part of the, the performance upgrades, this makes one uh, a much simpler job, it puts the data in the right place, and gives the compiler more hints to make more optimal shaders as it goes through. Uh, a few other features, map buffer alignment. Uh, once again, graphics is a high performance computing uh, discipline, and quite often people interleave different kinds of computations. So one thing they like to do is be able to take their data from the GL that they've worked on and present it back to the CPU for, for their modification. And there's a technique for doing that called map buffer. One of the problems was map buffer didn't always return a pointer that you could use with acceleration instruction sets like SSE or ABX. And so we've added that in there. If you're looking to get the absolute maximum performance out of your application, including using uh, these accelerated instructions from the CPU, this is a really important piece. So we've added that in. Um, and a couple other things. Conservative depth allows you to do some advanced uh, uh, 
object occlusion testing. So to dive into some of the, the stronger hitting features, uh, texture storage, once again, the, the, the reason this is so important is a texture map uh, is just an image that you apply some use of geometry. That's fine. There's a technique called mip mapping where you take that texture and make multiple versions of it in smaller and smaller resolutions so that you get better uh, visual quality as you render them on the screen. OpenGL possibly has allowed you to build this thing called mip map stack, that's the collection of mip maps, in a piecemeal way. So you can fill in one, fill in another, fill in another. Uh, the odd thing is, logically you go, well, you know, if I have an image that's 512, I need uh, nine layers inside of there. But there was nothing in the API that required you to do that. And OpenGL doesn't know what to do if there's a hole inside of this stack of things. If you don't provide it an image, it goes, I don't know. Um, and quite often there's an unwritten standard where most people just render that object in white. So have you ever done OpenGL, any OpenGL programming and done texture mapping and got white objects for reasons you can't understand? This is one reflection of that. Texture storage makes sure that doesn't happen. It guarantees that all the texture maps are always what's called complete. They'll always render something. The something is up to you. If you don't initialize the data, you'll get some garbage on the screen, but at least something. But it won't cause a problem. Anyway. So this, this makes driver writers very excited. It makes their life. As far as the user goes, it helps prevent some errors in a very obvious and easy to learn way. So that's quite useful. Um, image load, store, and atomic counters are really quite a, a new and innovative technique that really allow a transition in how graphics is done. Specifically speaking, what, what they do is allow you to take and write to arbitrary memory locations in the framework. So when you're doing graphics, right, you're illuminating pixel that gets the store color and depth value. And you can only write to that particular address. And you can only write one piece of data. With image load store, what it allows you to do is record multiple sets of data for a single pixel. So in the case of order independent transparency, like for example, if you look at the armadillo, there's certainly a front and a back to that. In order to get the right transparency to be able to see through it, you'd actually previously have had to sort all the polygons from back to front and render them blended to get the right answer. Using image load store and atomic counters, what you can do is render all the geometry, and instead of just writing the pixel, uh, that is the color, for that piece of uh, that geometric print that went into the pipe, you also write its distance from the eye. So now you have two bits of information. You have a color and you have a distance. When it comes time to make the final uh, image, this is kind of a two-pass technique. The first one allows you just to write the colors and basically record every color that would impact that pixel along with its depth value. The second pass, you basically take and sort that list based on depth, and then you can accumulate the results back and you get what's called order independent transparency. Uh, this is, gives you the right physical result. It matches the way that light actually interacts with transparent objects. So you get the right result, and you don't have to do anything special. That special piece was sorting your geometry one is a very difficult problem to do, uh, particularly if you what's called interpenetrating geometry. If you're trying to come together, sorting that's kind of a bit of a mess. This simplifies everything. And because it's hardware accelerated in the GPU, it's in some cases one and a half to two times faster. And that performance is only going to increase from there. So this enables better techniques and gives you better results at a faster point. And it's a no lose proposition. And actually, all the work just comes into updating your shaders and a couple of lines of shader codes do that. Another technique that we discussed is something called transform feedback instance. Now, OGL4 includes something called tessellation shading. And tessellation shading is a way to uh, effectively generate multiple geometric primitives inside of uh, the graphics pipe. So I'm going to step away from the mic for a second. The idea here is that this is an architectural rendering, and it's a fairly simple example, but all of these curves that are inside of here. Normally, you would have to generate them using kind of a, a polyline segment. So a lot of line segments kind of blended around this, the shape of a curve. You can actually use tessellation shaders to generate these. Now, you see in the, this particular uh, rendering, this object, which is this room, is in there uh, about 15 times, uh, more like 13, actually. And if you did this in the normal way you would do the, the, the pipeline, you'd have to draw the exact same thing that the, those 13 times that you go through. The transform feedback allows you to capture how one of these rooms would be rendered and store it down in the GPU. What it's, uh, instancing does is allow you to take that same bit of geometry and render it multiple times, but each time transform it a little bit. So right, maybe this is the base model. The first time we just reflected around this wall. So that's just a matrix transformation. In fact, that's what happens for all of these. 
This new feature, Transform Feedback Instance, allows you to generate a set of geometry, and then, you know, and what's important about this is that's generated in the GPU and stored in GPU memory. Then we can use that same piece of geometry multiple times through to do the render. So you only specify geometry and talk from the CPU to the GPU, which is the slowest part of this process. Once, after that, you have your geometry resident in the GPU, and you can get really, really great performance out. This makes things go many, many times faster than the alternatives inside of the application. So that is having your application actually send the data down these 13 times. Now, we have capabilities for doing transform feedback before. You could take and record these results. And we have results for being able to do instant rendering, instance rendering, but we didn't have the two together. And sadly, the, the sum of the parts, that is transform feedback and instant rendering, in this case is actually far greater than doing both techniques separately. So this is a really nice performance win. Uh, if it applies to your particular things. I don't know if any of you are doing, so for example, gaming, if you need to work with uh, lots of characters, you know, crowds and that kind of stuff. Uh, transform feedback and some rendering would be a great place to apply that technology. Now, another one is compressed pixel storage format. And basically the way this works is <clears throat> your application would uh, load a compressed texture and we can transmit that down to the GPU. Now, the first time through, of course, there's a copy. There's a copy from the application down to the GPU. But if in some frames of rendering you need to update that texture now, well, you run into some problems. So let's say, for example, um, the application needs to update that blue region. Classically, what you'd have to do is update it in the memory version of it in the application and then transmit the entire set of data back down to the pipe. The GPU memory, well, we didn't really have a structured way of knowing exactly where to update that, but it wasn't uh, a good detailing of both the compressed texture format and a way to expose that out to the application program to say, just update this region. What we wound up doing is compressed texture storage is, well, this is the way you do the initial loading of the texture map, called geo compressed text image, um, and that will take from application memory and put it down to the GPU. And previously, you would have updated the blue region and had to transfer all the data down. Geo compressed text of image uh, allows the application to just take and update a small region. So instead of modifying the original texture, you provided a subsequent memory region, and that gets transmitted down to the pipeline. Well, the new and most efficient way is that you update the original texture, the original compressed texture, and just say, look at that bit of memory and transfer that down. So it saves you doing an additional memory allocation and redundant data copy that you have in the second case because you need to update that blue box in two places. It doesn't seem like very much, but when you're trying to update thousands of textures like modern games have that are compressed, this saves a lot of time because you don't have this intermediate copy every time through. It's just one more, I and mean, at this point OpenGL is a fairly well-established API, but there are lots of places where we're continuing to tweak performance. Uh, almost finally, we added in the, the shading language 420 pack, and in this particular case, these are additions to the OpenGL shading language, that is GLSL 420 uh, edition. So each version of OpenGL comes with a new version of the OpenGL shading language. And this one includes a lot of things for enhancing compute um, and making it simpler to write the, the uh, shaders. The, previously, there had been a lot of, you needed the API to do certain things on behalf of the shaders and connect them up. One of the things that came in in this shading pack is to simplify that. So, one, for example, is you can now have C style, C style initializers. You know, when you have an array that goes, you know, A square brackets equals curly brace, X, Y, Z, you know, add some numbers, close curly brace. Previously, you were unable to do that inside of GLSL. Now, this is a new feature that uh, allows you to be able to do that. We also uh, homogenize the API such that any data type that's available inside of there. So, GLSL has scalar data types, float, int, unsigned int, and boolean, and vector types. So, there's vec2, vec3, vec4 for floating point numbers, uh, and IVEC for integer versions of that, VEC for unsigned, and so on and so forth, and matrices. All of those type now, including the scalar version, that would be just like we're going to float, now have a length method, which might seem a little funny for why do I need to know the length of a scalar, but it allows you to make your code more simple. Regardless of the type that you've got, you now can use you know, this variable name dot length inside of for loops to be able to do computation. While that's interesting, the really more powerful part of this is a technique called swizzling. Now, uh, presuming that at some point you want to program C if you're doing graphics. In C, right, if you have a structure, you can do structure.letter and access, well, structure.name and access a field of that. GLSL extends that slightly to allow you to, after that dot, 
put multiple, uh, multiple elements of that type. So for example, a vector 2 has two fields in it, an x field and a y field. You can do v.xy and extract both of those particular pieces. Additionally, you can do v.yx and actually reverse the order of the data before it's presented on the other side of the equal sign. Makes it nice to be able to uh, basically do swaps and swizzles, call them swizzles, to change the order of, uh, of data. A really great place to use this, for example, is if you're code porting code from, say, Linux to Windows. Windows prefers a pixel format that goes uh, BGR, blue, the green, the red. Linux is more red, the green, the blue. So you can use the swizzling technique to change the order of the color components uh, without having to do anything fancy. Now, what we have for the scalar part is, if you have a scale or a single number, well, one other thing you can do with swizzles is data replication. So for example, if you have a color and want to take the red channel and, and uh, spread it across green and blue to make a luminance image, you can basically go, my final color equals my input color dot R R R and it will duplicate the red channel across all the different pieces. The scalar swizzle allows you to do the same thing, but for a single number. So for example, if you know the luminance of an image and you need to populate uh, an RGB color, you can now do color equals my scalar float value C dot uh, XXX or RRR, um, and it will take and duplicate that number and spread it across uh, all the color components of the other image. So th this just makes for a little bit more flexibility, but oddly enough, this is something that was lacking in people like, we want that inside of uh, Some additional parts on qualifiers, you can now use constant right places to improve memory references and shaders. One of the big ones to simplify this is finding layout qualifiers. Inside of GLSL, when you go out and uh, take a look at any of the books that are on the subject, you'll see the discussion of this thing called layout. And layout's used in a lot of places to help initialize what we call the plumbing between the shader and the application. Right? You write OpenGL code, and you also write a shader, but those two things really don't connect together very well. There's some uh, pass through the driver that are necessary to take data that you might have had, so vertex data or color data, and make that available inside of a shader. There used to be a lot of function calls you needed to kind of patch all these pieces together. The layout qualifiers allow you to do this inside of the shader, and it eliminates one, a lot of function calls, and two, puts the data in the right place. You've got a variable name that's going to be attached to a particular piece of OpenGL state. You can put that all in the shader where that's the right place to decode all that information, and not have to worry about updating your application or getting things out of the same. So that really helps quite a lot of things. Uh, some other things, we have improved comments and uh, uh, Continuation characters. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a shading language, language description. It's as exciting as it gets. Uh, one of the last pieces I'll discuss here is about data packing. So, uh, shaders, and in particular pixels, I have become much more fluid. The, the original versions of the OpenGL shading language dealt specifically with just floating point numbers. The only values that you had available in most of your shaders were just floats and, and that. But as GPUs have enhanced, the integers, unsigned integers, have become first class citizens. And in a lot of cases, you might need data that you want to reuse somewhere else. Um, so you might need to uh, pack and unpack data for the purpose of either performance, uh, memory optimization, and so on. And you haven't been able to do this inside of uh, GLSL. So we added a whole bunch of different data packing formats that allow you to take effectively vectors of floating point numbers and pack them into an integer back and forth. So this allows for better computation, and it's actually more of a computational aspect as compared to rendering. This allows you to do a lot of data munching, if you will, uh, transformations inside of a shader to take advantage of the computational power of the GPU without having to you know, go back and use the CPU to do mundane tasks like packing data and uh, bits and shift and so on and so forth. So with that, that's a real quick update about uh, what's going on with OpenGL. I'm happy to entertain any questions. All right, well, thank you very much.